right, so today our speaker is uh, the new doctor, Antonio Macias Gañizares, um, who is a PhD student here at uh, Georgia Tech in the School of uh, Aerospace Engineering. And as I just alluded to, he just defended a couple weeks ago and is just waiting for things to wrap up so he can finally say that he's graduated from her program. Uh, he is uh, an engineer, I guess by title, but I really think he's a planetary scientist, an astrobiologist. A lot of his research um, through his PhD has been focused on better understanding um, ice textures on uh, planetary bodies that have ice, in particular ocean worlds. And today we're gonna be learning uh, some of his PhD work um, that he's been doing, trying to simulate um, uh, features on uh, Europa, and I'm really excited that he's here. And and again, congratulations again. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Hernandez. Uh, well, uh, first of all, thank you very much for uh, having me here. My name is Antonio Macias, and uh, and today we will go and explore the surface of Europa and other similar airless uh, bodies in the outer solar system. We'll uh, study the surface evolution over the past uh, millions and millions of years. Um, so this work uh, is not working. Sorry, give me one second. All right, all right. Um, so, so this is this agenda. I'll first provide you with some motivation about what, uh, the problem, why it's important, and I will introduce some uh, features that are called penitentes, which are these statues uh, that uh, might be present on, on Europa. I will then go into a Denmark law, which are the models that I and a group of other students developed uh, for the past five or six years. Uh, I'll then use Europa as the case study, but please keep in mind that the methodology that I will introduce is also valid for many other uh, airless bodies like comets orbiting the sun or uh, anything that has a, a water surface, ice surface. Uh, and then I'll talk about the contributions and the future work uh, and some possible applications for this methodology. Okay. So the geologic processes that govern the surface morphology and the chemistry of these uh, airless bodies, uh, ice covered bodies in the outer solar system has gained increasing interest over the past several decades. This is both for the scientific questions that these uh, worlds present, as well as for the relevant for future in situ exploration. Though we have today some engineering capabilities like terrain relative navigation that allow us to safely land on the surfaces of, of uh, other uh, worlds like Mars, for example, it is uh, nevertheless important to understand uh, what the steady state of the surface, what the, the current state of the surface size on these worlds uh, look today. Now, there has been lots of work dedicated to the large to small scale geology of these worlds, like there are some chaos arrays of Europa, some geological uh, and topographic maps of Ga uh, Ganymede and Enceladus, respectively. But uh, much remains to be understood about the centimeter to meter scale morphology. This is uh, uh, even smaller than the small scale uh, geology of these worlds. Like, we, we know a lot about the chaos arrays of Europa, but what happens when we zoom into that terrain? So, that is the focus of this, uh, this work. Now, there is one very specific hypothesis, and that is that some structures that are called penitentes, they form on the surfaces of, uh, of Jupiter's moon Europa, and that they can actually be several meters in height. So here you can see some images of uh, penitentes on Earth. They typically form on uh, uh, high altitude snow fields. Uh, they can actually be really tall on Earth. They reach uh, up to up to four meters. I think this is the tallest uh, penitente that uh, ever been recorded. And, uh, and as a bonus figure here on the, uh, the small figures, uh, it's a uh, prototype, the first prototype of the Europa lander. Um, this is a, a figure that, uh, that I pulled from the group with JPL. So I hope that you enjoyed that one. Uh, and um, the issue here is that it has been shown that this hypothesis or the physics that were used to construct this hypothesis uh, might not apply for the exosphere conditions of, of Europa. Or that is penitent as a hazard for a future lander. If they exist, let's say, of this uh, 50 meters uh, scale, that would definitely, uh, definitely make it difficult to navigate if we ever land on, on Europa. Now, interestingly, penitentes have been observed in other planetary bodies, like Pluto, which does has a, a significant uh, atmosphere that changes uh, with season. And they're also hypothesized to form on Mars, though they have yet uh, to be observed there. Uh, now, on Earth, penitentes are made from water, typically water ice, but on Pluto, they are likely made from methane. Uh, the goals we made from nitrogen, but there's a study that argues that uh, it is impossible for uh, 
uh, nitrogen beneath them that still exist on Pluto. Uh, on Mars, they will be made from carbon dioxide. On Mars, they will also be made uh, on the poles, uh, like on Earth, uh, typically in the equator. Now, on Earth, penitents are made from compact snow or ice, and they uh, they uh, they get to grow in this high altitude snow field that is a uh, uh, high, uh, sorry, low pressure, low temperature, high insulation. And the definition of what is called penitentes, it actually comes from the shores. It is uh, because the, it resembles what the, the repenting people from the shores uh, look like. That's uh, what it gives them the name. It also uh, resembles, uh, uh, you know, I'll show you other pictures in a second, but it resembles a, a, a pair of praying hands to the sky, which also gives the, kind of the name of uh, penitentes. Uh, now, contrary to intuition, the way the penitentes grow is by deepening on the troughs. For example, this is the life cycle of a penitente field. Uh, it starts by being a planar snow field with some irregularities, and then sunlight gets focused on the depressions, which, which causes the depressions to sublimate faster. It, it increases the, the melting rate, and uh, they, they get deeper. And this happens until there is some sort of atmospheric phenomenon, like snowing, for example, and then uh, the snow fills in the gaps between penitentes, and it returns the snow field to the initial condition, which is a planar snow field with some mild irregularities, ready for the next season to start growing penitentes again. So they're very seasonal features. Uh, but something that is required is faster recession rate in the, in the troughs with respect to the regions. That is how, how they grow on Earth, and that is uh, how um, I'm aiming uh, to, to test whether they grow on, on Europa. Now, the first theory was made by Darwin in 1839. It wasn't very sophisticated, but it was very interesting. He, he described his first encounter with penitentes as he was traveling through Chile and through La Plata, and uh, he posted some of the, the risks for penitentes about uh, travel and commerce. Uh, and actually, if you read uh, the, the small uh, paragraph that he wrote about it, it turns out that actual, uh, Darwin actually nailed it how penitentes form. Uh, you know, he didn't examine them for long, but he uh, he was correcting his assumptions. Uh, so penitent formation is a very complex process. Uh, there are many models out there, and the models have been validated through experiments and through theory. Uh, so they work. Penitent formation on Earth is, is a very well studied process. Now, applying these models to Europa, it is really problematic because the conditions are different. Like worlds like Earth, Mars, and Pluto, they have atmosphere. There's fluid dynamical phenomena like wind and boundary layers. But worlds like Europa, there is only an exosphere present where the mean free path between particle collisions is so many kilometers. So the models that are deemed to study penitent deformation on Earth do not apply to the exospheric nature of worlds like, like Europa. Now, here's a comparison of the physics some of the physical mechanisms that play some role in the formation of penitentes. And as you can see, many of them are not present or are uh, negligible on Europa. So what I did is that I uh, classified this into two distinct uh, groups, the relative heat transfer group and the molecular group. Uh, the relative heat transfer considers uh, so radiation, black hole radiation, heat conduction, and so on. Um, when I looked at what are those mechanisms on Europa, that may play some significant role on the evolution of the surface, uh, I noticed that solar radiation and black body radiation seem to be the most important. Black body radiation from Jupiter is about an order of magnitude of less uh, of an impact, so I'm neglecting that one. Now, from the molecular transport side, of, uh, is, uh, this is about sublimation of redeposition. What are the processes that cause some uh, change in the surface shape? Uh, we have the sublimation ray, ion spotting ray, impact garden, meteorite impacts. And from, from here, we see that, uh, assuming some average conditions, the sublimation rate is the, the dominant mechanism. So if penitentes were to be observed in Europa, they are most likely be uh, through sublimation. So, so I neglect uh, ion spotting and impact garden because the effect is an order of magnitude less than, than sublimation. Now, here's a curious note. Uh, in the absence of melting, like happens on Europa, the actual term penitente loses its significance for some large part of the uh, scientific community. And it's because uh, the father of penitente, uh, uh, an author called uh, Liberty, he described uh, melting being the initial process, on the, uh, well, the actual process that yielded formation of penitente. Because we have no melting on Europa, we technically cannot call them penitentes. I'm not a huge fan of this because uh, the shape is very indicative of what a penitente is. Uh, so we'll still call it penitent uh, during this work. 
Um, here's how the uh, different physical mechanisms can enable the formation of brain dendrite. We have these four mechanisms, and sublimation is the only one that can change the shape of the surface. Uh, but sublimation depends on this rate of heat transfer uh, 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 physical processes, so they have to be linked in some sort of way. And the idea is that the radiation uh, processes will determine the surface temperature profile, and the sublimation will determine the surface evolution. And this is the, the process that I propose to uh, basically grow penitentes. Now, nevertheless, no matter what, we require higher recession rate at the trough. Trough has to recede faster uh, than, the, than the penitentiary ridges, uh, which means higher sublimation rate at the trough. It also means higher temperature at the trough. So the, the trough temperature has to be higher than the ridge term temperature. Here is a, a schematic of a cycle, a simulated cycle, of how it, uh, it could uh, work in Europa. We have the sun moving around, it's uh, launching photons as, as it moves. Once the photons reach the, the eyes, they start scattering, and they enter, they start depositing their energy. And I use this to calculate a heat source distribution. And this heat source distribution, I uh, run some heat conduction analysis to get a temperature profile within the eyes from which I extract the surface temperature as the surface temperature start increasing, the molecules start moving around. I track those molecules, which leads to some surface uh, evolution. And I repeat this process over uh, millions and millions of years, because it turns out that uh, because the surface temperature is really, really low on Europa, it will take, for example, 10 million years for the surface to receive half a meter, a really low uh, temperature. Uh, so I'd like now to introduce uh, the code that I developed, which is called the R Cosmos. It's a, it's a code that integrates every single physical process that I presented to this point, and also adds some additional physics. So, so, so here is our cosmos. It is a, again, an integration. And here what you see is a natural simulation of the code. Uh, it comprises solar radiation, black body radiation, heat conduction, uh, surface evolution, uh, sublimation, all these physical processes integrated into one single code. And, uh, the idea is that I integrate, well, I, sorry, I iterate between the different modules within the R-Cosmos uh, suite, and then um, I'm able to simulate the surface evolution over you know, millions and millions of years. Uh, and of course, this is at the highest level. Within the code itself, there are many levels of physics, like, uh, like me theory, for example, or uh, material properties vary with temperature, and uh, a lot of uh, uh, small things that I consider to make this code uh, very realistic, or, or as realistic as I could get it to be. Here's how the code works. We have the different modules. So I'll, I'll explain what this PMC and SMC uh, means. But the idea is that we use this, uh, this PMC group to generate some sort of surface temperature profile. Uh, and then I use this SMC group to uh, calculate the, uh, the changes in the, in the surface shape for the surface morphology change. Uh, I repeat this process again over a million or millions of years and I get the surface evolution of any particularly uh, airless world of, of interest. So the photo Monte Carlo code uh, is the, the radiation code. Because the surface shape changes over time, it is necessary to simulate uh, the temperature profile with the surface shape. Uh, so that is why we developed the photo Monte Carlo model. And this is a, this is a code that was developed by a, a colleague of mine. His name is Anthony Carrion. He uh, took up on the code. He developed most of it. Once he left the project, there's another friend of mine who took on his work. His name was Andy Sue. And my contribution to the code is that I added most, more physics, uh, physics to it. I, I improved every single one of these uh, 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 processes that you, that you see here. The photo Monte Carlo code calculates uh, the temperature profile within the ice uh, as the sun moves around during the whole uh, day and year on Europa. And, uh, I, from that temperature profile, again, I extract the surface temperature, which is, it will be the input to the, to the following code, uh, which is called the sublimation Monte Carlo code. As you can guess, these are Monte Carlo codes, well, both of them, so they take a little bit of time to run. Um, a sublimation, uh, it is a very straightforward one in Europa. We have some uh, surface, some, uh, sorry, some molecules in the surface that are emitted because the mean free pass is really large, particles typically traveling uh, rectilinear trajectories. They, they travel straight, and they do so in a way that they might uh, impact a uh, surface region, resulting in a net mass exchange, or they might use lift to space, resulting in a net uh, mass loss, 
or maybe from gravity they come back and they hit the ice again. Uh, so you know, different uh, different possibilities. But this code actually enables these uh, simulations of Europa that are not practical, not experimentally practical because again the temperature is so low that we really cannot simulate this on a on a laboratory setting, for example. Uh, and one particularly one particular improvement to the uh, to the whole analysis of the formation with this code is that if you notice the surface is actually uh, rough, so we can get any level of roughness that we want. We can make any kind of surface shapes that we want. It doesn't really matter. The code will really handle it. And uh, that was you know, one of the, the biggest uh, selling points of, of this code. Uh, another uh, code is the, uh, uh, well, the one that we had to develop as the result of sublimation, because there is a, a net molecular outflux or, or change of mass between uh, surface regions. The, the surface shape changes. So I had to build a model that will account for the surface shape. Well, basically, that will reconstruct the surface after it changes. And here's how I did it. I calculated the displacement rate along the surface. I moved the, uh, the surface, uh, I basically break the surface apart. And then I find those uh, elements or facets. I forgot to mention that I uh, discretize the surface into facets. Uh, but I uh, find those that have completely crossed, and I get rid of them. And then I average between the endpoints of surface elements to get a new reconstructed surface. Um, the idea in a process like this is that uh, you know I will be able to account for for large displacements of the surface uh, without negligible losses because uh, because this process uh, uh, somehow uh, relieves some of the uh, limitations of previous codes that uh, we had to have very small deformations in order for them to work. Uh, but because we're simulating this over millions and millions of years. We wanted to have a code that will be able to deal with this uh, for what? So, um, but apart from integrating the, the codes, the R Cosmos also brings additional physics into the simulations. Like orbital mechanics, for example, can simulate the seasonal variation of, of Europa by accounting for the distance from the sun and the axial tilt, although it's not much on, on Europa, uh, it might. Uh, it is definitely important for work like in Enceladus, for example. Uh, uh, it also accounts for surface orientation. Uh, we might be able to orient the surface so that the regions are running east, west, or north, south, and they might uh, and they yield different results. And it also accounts for sorry, skip one slide. It also accounts for uh, the snow fuel latitude uh, because penitentes on Earth they typically form up to let's say thirty or forty-five degrees uh, latitude. Um, it is possible that they might also form in certain latitudes on Europa. Uh, so I wanted to account for that as well. And one of the implications of this modeling is that uh, the length of daylight will change depending on where you are in Europa, similar to, to Earth. So I use this case as validation. I, uh, you know, after I constructed the code, I uh, went and found some data for some cities. Uh, this is a funny Easter egg that I left in my dissertation. These are some of the cities that I've lived in before I Got here, except Athens. Athens is the city of my advisor. Uh, and I compared them to actual data, and I'm off by about seven minutes every uh, year or so. And the seven minutes actually come from axial precession, which one I made an assumption in the, in the code. Uh, axial precession might be important for Earth, but it wasn't important for, for Europa. So, how can penitent form in Europa? And Perhaps this is one of the most interesting questions in the literature. And the literature is really clear about this. It says it's reflection of sunlight from the snow laterals, uh, diffusion of sunlight. And these statements, which are, you know, these two models are the most relevant models uh, uh, today, they're very uh, proved uh, or validated through experimental results. So they work and they're true. But when we look at Europa, because it's so far away, then sunlight, when it gets there, is really weak. And the effect that it might have, that the solar radiation might have on penetrant deformation might be diminished by that point. So let's consider this following process so we can answer that question. I'll simulate one cycle on Europa, and then I will find what is the uh, heat source distribution within the ice, uh, and I will uh, break apart the different mechanisms so that uh, I calculate, I, I estimate which one is the one that is actually contributing to penetrant deformation. And, um, Here's an example of the total heat source distribution. So every mechanism combined. And what you see is that there is a higher energy distribution in the troughs. 
and there is a really low energy distribution in the regions. What this means is that, and by the way, as uh, you recall from before, uh, higher energy in the troughs than uh, with respect to the peaks and higher temperature in the troughs, uh, it is what is required for penitentes to grow. Um, but this doesn't tell you uh, where it actually comes from. Uh, so when I do and I split apart these two processes, I see that for solar radiation, the energy distribution is in the trough, in the trough and the ridges is roughly the same. But for so, uh, for thermal radiation, that is a photon being emitted from the surface of the snow, the trough temp, uh, the trough energy distribution is much higher. Which means that once we get to Europa, the actual enabling mechanism is black water radiation. It's not solar radiation like on Earth. So. There has to be some sort of point in between Earth and Europa where they flip, where the, the sun uh, starts being the, the more important than blood body becomes the, the more important. Now, that is something that I did not explore in this work, but I thought it would be a good question to ask uh, for future work. So I went in, uh, and, by the way, before doing this, I, uh, I have some other process. This is also some uh, slides that I picked from my dissertation, but uh, this is a diurnal cycle or uh, what I simulated two types of, uh, of penitent fields. One that is oriented north-south, that is that uh, the ridges run perpendicular to a solar path. Uh, and the other one that is oriented is west, so the ridges are aligned with the solar path. On Earth, the, the ridges are aligned with the solar path. So the second case would be the most representative of what uh, penitent deformation on Earth would be. And um, as you see, there is a higher energy and higher temperatures overall when the sun is oriented parallel to the ridges. And, and this is what actually causes the uh, penitent formation in that specific direction. Um, it turns out that this is actually an effect of surface area, the, basically the view of the surface that the sun has direct uh, uh, contribution to, and also uh, the time that a given surface region receives some uh, so, uh, sunlight uh, you know, during the diurnal cycle. Uh, because the north-south penitentes are again oriented north-south, there is some shallowing effect that happens during the day, and that will cause the, the less surface temperature with respect to the east-west penitentes. Now, to illustrate this a little bit better, here is what the formation of penitentes on Europa will be like. So this is a rose diagram. Uh, the blue region means that penitentes will form. Uh, as you see, they're preferentially oriented east-west. The ridges, again, run east-west. And as a matter of fact, none of them run north-south. Uh, this is, of course, for a very specific simulation. There are thousands of simulations that I can try, and, and uh, it's very difficult to make a general statement. But in general, if penitentes would be oriented uh, um, if penitents will be present on Europa, they will likely be oriented east west. Uh, now, something that this diagram also tells you is that because very penitents can also form in other uh, orientations, it is likely that they're not quite two dimensional features uh, as I was uh, assuming in my modeling, they're actually three dimensional shapes. And, and they are two dimensional shapes in, in, in nature. That's what we observe on Earth. Um, it's just that uh, from the modeling standpoint, um, uh, at least at the general stage of growing penitentes, they're typically two-dimensional. So that's, uh, that's, that's why we assume that uh, in the first place. So now, if I assume an east-west orientation, and I use these parameters, by the way, again, this is uh, part of my dissertation, have an, uh, uh, an explanation of why I use these parameters. It turns out that this is an uh, optimization problem that I ran, and I found out these conditions were the, the most unstable terrain in Europa. Um, I will calculate what is this, uh, this growth rate of penitentes during daytime. So the figure that you see is the, uh, the figure above. It represents the, the region of which penitentes grow. And as you see, they don't grow, they, they grow all the time, but the period where they grow the most is during daytime. The sunlight is out when the snow, uh, snow field is warm, uh, they tend to grow more, but they grow more in the afternoon. They don't quite grow uh, as much at the subsolar point, which is uh, at noon. Uh, and it turns out that there is a bit of a competing effect between the, this delta T, which is you know, the, the higher radiation, and the actual uh, point at which the sublimation rate is maximized. Uh, this, uh, this happens because 
Again, there's some heat absorption within the ice. There is some energy that is being uh, held on uh, by the snow, and during the early afternoon, it's, it's being released. Uh, that's, that's kind of the effect of blood water radiation. But what we can see here, too, is in this uh, uh, panel C figure, uh, is that there is some sort of decoupling between the physics. So when the density is low, like this 200 uh, kilograms per meter cube in this thermal energy of 95 k. By the way, the thermal energy is, uh, is found from the uh, the best fit for thermal energy of Europe is found from uh, actual measurements. Uh, the density, I, I found it numerically. Uh, this is really fluffy snow. It's, uh, it's snow that falls apart. It's referred to uh, new snow. Uh, and when that happens, that is uh, basically refers to low thermal conduction, uh, you get differential sublimation rate on the surface. And it basically means that a penitent of this size is unlikely to form uh, because you will have some regions that are growing faster than the other. And you know, the surface is going to uh, play faster and eventually use collapse to itself. So what I did to that case is that then, uh, and by the way, you can see the, the material problems that are used in this side of, uh, in each figure. I picked two cases. I picked the most stable case and the least stable case. Uh, the most stable would mean that the surface is likely planar, or it's not moving as much. The least stable means the penitentes are forming. Uh, and once again, I found this from uh, doing an optimization problem. Uh, when we look at the most stable case, it's penitent the case, case uh, the sublimation rate is really slow. Like when the surface is stable on Europa, it doesn't move as much. It is, again, stable. Uh, but when the surface grows, uh, that is the surface is unstable, penitentes start growing and they grow faster every single uh, time. Well, as time passes by, they grow faster. And what this might suggest is that uh, there is some sort of mechanism on Europa that will, that similar to Earth, will cause penitentes to, to, to grow faster and faster every time, which then might become uh, an issue because if there is no stopping point, you can see how it will really become uh, uh, a dangerous terrain or hazardous terrain uh, over time. So here is this uh, evidence of uh, this exponential growth and decay rates. So, uh, I ignore the one on top that's uh, the stable case, but the one on the on the bottom, you'll see this exponential growth in the, the aspect ratio, which means that again, the surface is growing faster and faster over time. and uh, and while maybe this condition might not be the one on, on Europa, it, say, it means that if penitentes form on Europa, they are possibly, like most likely, a very, uh, uh, well, an issue for a future mission over there. Now, the way that uh, the literature uh, determines whether penitentes form or don't is by doing something called a linear stability analysis. And this is an analysis that. Uh, looks at an instant in time at a given geometry and material properties and uh, determines whether the surface is stable or unstable. So as you saw before, like this stable surface remains stable, the unstable surface remains unstable. So this is what this is, uh, what this figure is portraying, but of course for a range of conditions because we truly don't know what they will look in Europa. But regardless of the condition, you will see that uh, on, the, on the aspect ratio, by the way, uh, Going down in this plot is an uh, increasing aspiration, which means that the surface is getting a pointer and pointer, like taller and taller. Uh, uh, the first one is, is a nearly planar snow field, which, as you might recall, is the initial condition for a penitent field. But when we look at Europa, it is very unlikely that penitents actually form at these very small scales, which means that it is difficult for penitents to start growing on Europa and for them to have some chance of at least growing, it means that we have to have a prescribed surface geometry, uh, which might be possible if there is maybe some meteorite event that just creates uh, certain conditions, uh, but are likely to occur just uh, uh, considering the uh, sublimation process uh, itself. Uh, but this also uh, poses some interesting question, like, um, for example, if, if you might start uh, under some conditions that penitentes form, and then later, the snow field changes uh, the properties, uh, or maybe for compaction, the density increases, you might have some stopping point in which penitentes just stop, and then maybe become stable and, uh, and start decaying. Uh, so 
right? It's difficult to tell without actually sub, uh, uh, sorry, simulating this over time, which is what I what I do next. But before I uh, sublimate this, uh, sorry, simulate this over Euler time scale, what I need to do is to find out what is the likely uh, uh, characteristic scale of penitentes on on Europa. So I have this case. Uh, once again, it is it is not a unique case. Uh, it changes depending on the material properties and the conditions. Uh, but this represents a uh, the most unstable terrain on Europa. And what I did is that I calculated the growth rate of the surface for different characteristic lengths. And as you see, the one that dominates, uh, the one that dominates everything is a wavelength of about nine meters. Uh, there are also some possible wavelengths. And, uh, and the reason that this actually occurs is because it happens to be correlated to the optical depth, to the thermal skin depth. And the, the last one is a combination, it's, it's a terrain composition morphology combination and as well as the rotation period of Europa. Nevertheless, it's a dominant wavelength that is nine meter. This means that superintendents form on Europa at the most optimum conditions that I was able to find, they will likely be made, uh, will we'll have a space in between the ridges of nine meters. That's what it means. Uh, so the next step, naturally, is to pick this wavelength and then simulate it over, over time to see what it, what it does. And then, uh, well, that's what it did. Uh, the surface on the left, uh, the simulation on the left, that is the, the actual simulation that I use uh, with, the, with the original aspect ratio to get the, um, uh, the, the instability condition, so that, that nine meter wavelength. Uh, and what you can see is that there's only a small region on the surface where there is actually some morphological change. The rest of the surface remains the same over time, and this happens because there is a huge difference in the surface temperature and uh, uh, the, the sublimation rate increases exponentially with, uh, with temperature because the temperature is so different then only the trough of penitentes here moves, which means that it's unlikely that the surface made it to this original point in the first place. Like there's no way of going backward. We can only, only go, go forward. Uh, so, so essentially, there is a decoupling of the physics. I keep saying decoupling, it means that there is a region that grows, it's another region that doesn't grow. Uh, and though, why are we then considering this other region that barely moves? We should have just focus on the other one, but the other one couldn't have grown unless it was at that point. So uh, could a surface be uh, nine meter by four meter tall? No, at least through sublimation, it won't be possible. Uh, it might be possible through some other mechanisms, like again, some meteorite impacts, but if you start with a planet that's no fuel and you let it revolve, it is uh, it's not possible for them to get, or it's highly unlikely at the best of the cases to uh, get to you know, nine meter wide by four and a half meter tall. Um, then um, what I did is that I, I reduced the surface aspiration until I found some metastable state. Metastable means that the surface is stable until something else happens. And this, uh, I don't know, any uh, hypothetical phenomenon might break the stability and will cause penitent to support. Uh, the surface ended up being about zero, uh, having an aspect ratio of 0 0.05, which means that it's a very planar snow field. It's, a, it's like a big sand dune, about nine meter wide, uh, which is unlikely to pose a, a hazard for a future lander on Europa. Uh, and the other wavelengths, they are just, uh, just too small to be even uh, posing a hazard for Europa either way, I'm sorry, posing a hazard for a future lander on Europa uh, because the lander can just really just go over them. Uh, nevertheless, they may exist in Europa and it is possible that they exist. I found some conditions where penitentes uh, will exist like the simulation that I, that I showed you before. Um, so we have to look for, for them. Um, but because uh, penitent deformation is possible, uh, it is important to estimate where it is likely for penitentes to exist on Europa. Uh, I can't consider every single condition because uh, well, the code takes a really long time to, to run. And despite me doing uh, lots of optimizations and sort of modeling to, to get the results, uh, it's impossible to get every single possible combination uh, out there. Uh, so this is one of the best uh, scenarios. Uh, this image shows uh, two different terrains, one located at the trailing, uh, and, uh, say, sub-Jovian hemisphere, the other one uh, at the leading anti-Jovian hemisphere. 
And if you see, uh, pretends are likely to grow on the, on the top uh, figure, uh, very unlikely to grow on the bottom. They can grow, but they're not going to move as much. Right? If you see the axis, uh, it's about uh, 4, 10 to the negative 5, 5, 10 to the negative 5 uh, meters per million years, so, you know, about 4 uh, centimeters or so. Uh, so, regions near the trailing and so Jovian hemisphere are more unstable, near the uh, leading and anti Jovian hemisphere are more stable. So, my recommendation is that some future missions that are dedicated to exploring Europa, like a future lander, for the sake of Europa, any other similar world, should target bottom. I shouldn't say that, I should say for Europa, because this is very specific to Europa. Uh, they should target the, uh, the sorry, uh, leading anti Jovian hemisphere, because the surface is likely to be. Planet. It's, uh, it's very unlikely that Penitent is formed over there because the thermal conductivity is so high that it makes it impossible for Penitent to, to grow. And here's something uh, interesting that I want to leave you to uh, finish the presentation. Uh, I mentioned that Penitent has followed the sun path across the sky. Uh, here's what I'm able to accomplish with my model. I started with a Penitent oriented uh, uh, vertical and then I tilted the sun just a little bit. Uh, basically, I set a latitude of 10 degrees and I uh, simulated over time. And as you see, the surface starts kind of getting the shape of, uh, it's basically pointing towards the sun. If you keep simulating this, I stop at 100 million years because the surface edge of Europa, but if you keep doing this, it will eventually become a tilted penitente, which we do observe on Earth. They don't get very tall, but we do observe them on Earth. Uh, something interesting to note is that uh, the surface here is approaching, as you see this panel B, uh, the, there's a tendency of, uh, of equal sublimation rays along the surface, which means that this geometry is likely getting stable. And if you see the, uh, the gaps between the different successions is getting smaller and smaller, it basically means that there's going to be a point in which this is going to stop and it's going to remain uh, stable over time or, or at least uh, metastable. But similar to Earth, they're highly, likely, uh, highly unlikely to exceed some high latitudes uh, um, they are very unlikely to exist uh, at the poles, for example, uh, and uh, this might bring some implications for Mars as well, because again, they're hypothesized to form on the poles, uh, for Encelados as well. Uh, it's highly unlikely that they can, uh, because they they require some direct insulation, we, we, we just don't get at those places. Now, in the current state of the code, there are some applications that I've listed uh, in the hope that I'll be able to pursue or, or help somebody else pursue them. Uh, and it's to, to find out what are these general conditions for penitent deformation. Uh, uh, it will be a direct continuation. Sorry that I called this dissertation here. Uh, this again was part of my dissertation. But uh, the idea is that you know finding or creating some sort of map of Europa and Enceladus and pinpointing what are the regions where penitentes might form, where they might not, and this will help to find a suitable landing, landing site for a, for a lander uh, in the future. Uh, the other one is the surface evolution of other airless worlds. Like for example, you know, I'll link step two and four here. Uh, we can calculate this uh, sublimation of comets, why they have this characteristic shape over time as they orbit the sun. Uh, this one application of the code. The third one is uh, using ice as construction material. This was an idea from uh, Professor Carr. Say, what if we encapsulate a uh, spacecraft with ice and then we just send it from here to Mars? Uh, does it hold? Uh, and you know, might be a really good uh, application for radiation shielding, for example. Uh, and then, if we make some minor modifications to the code, we can also get some applications. And by the way, this is by no means a comprehensive list. The, the code can do uh, several other stuff. Uh, but we can, because the surface of Europe and other worlds are not quite pure water ice, like I saw here. Uh, if we account for multiple species and the sublimation of multiple species, we can get some more realistic simulation. Uh, maybe some other worlds uh, that require additional physics like EO. Uh, maybe later here sublimation might be important there. And uh, black body radiation from Jupiter is important because it's much closer to Jupiter. Uh, and uh, let's see, uh, four is actually an important one because when we land on those places, if we have a rough surface, it might be that the ejector from the rockets might come back and hit your spacecraft. And that's not a good thing. So I can use this code to uh, predict whether that could happen and uh, you know uh, mitigate uh, against that. And the last uh, 
uh, application that I found was to do remote sensing. So there's a the Europa Clipper mission that's currently on the way. Uh, we are able to, to, to look at Europa from the distance and reverse engineer the, the, the surface uh, geometry. Essentially find out what the surface looks like even before we get there. Um, so that's, uh, I thought it was an interesting application. Uh, there were some uh, publications results from this work. If you want to learn more about some physical experiments that we did, I suggest looking at the first uh, uh, publication. The second one, if you want to learn about molecular transport, my sublimation code and software morphology code, that's uh, the one that describes it. And then the, the photo Monte Carlo, the radiation heat conduction will be on the third uh, publication. So I want to, to thank uh, NASA for funding this project. My appreciation to Dr. Kevin Hand, who funded me since I was an undergraduate at uh, the University of Texas at Austin, and to Professor Maris for funding my undergraduate studies and my dissertation when I was here at Georgia Tech. Well, thank you very much. I'll